Y creo que no te vi. Ok, hi everyone, welcome to a new edition of the Children of the Seminar. Uh, today I have the pleasure of introducing Eric Endo, who is coming from uh, NYU Shanghai uh, to visit us. Who is going to be talking about control methods for dimensional long range easy model? Thank you, Santiago. So, hi, uh, nice to meet you. So, I'm Eric Endo. So, it's my first time here in the capital, my second time in Chile. I'm really enjoying a lot. And today, I'm going to talk about the contour methods, the usual contour that, if you are familiar with the pilot argument in the spin system. This is what we're going to present today, some quick review about the nearest neighbor's contour and some new things about the long range regime model. So let me start with the, let me start with the model of the Hamiltonian. Let me start with calling lambda to denote the finite subset on the lattice, the dimensional lattice, which will be our lattice that we're going to work in all of these models. Spin configuration, I'm going to use sigma to denote the spins. That's either that for each vertex, I'm considering the spin to be either plus one or minus one. So you're going to see that the model that we are considering is the easy model. And I'm always going to denote omega as a boundary condition. So this means that you're considering spins outside of this box lambda, a fixed uh, uh, configuration, let's call it this omega. The Hamiltonian here, I'm considering Hamiltonian to be as general as possible for the spin system, easy tight system. Know that the Hamiltonian is given by the minus sum of the two body interactions times the sigma i, sigma j. Okay? While this interaction j i j uh, depend on the signs and the values, I'm going to give some names. If it's always non-negative, I'm calling that model ferromagnetic. If that two body interaction equals to zero, Long range only having this contribution for the nearest neighbors. I'm calling this model nearest neighbor, nearest neighbor model. And I'm also going to consider in some slides the one that's long range, not only the one that's always positive, but I'm also going to give an explicit formula for these two body interactions. Okay? So this is the type of the Hamilton that we're going to work today. It's important to define the Gibbs measure. So here I'm always going to define beta to be one over the temperature, the inverse temperature. That's always a positive number. And the usual Gibbs measure, the e to the minus beta times Hamiltonian divide the partition function, the renormalization to make this measure to be a probability measure. Okay, so this is the Gibbs measure. And there are some type of questions about the Gibbs measure that uh, for a given model, I would like to see uh, the phase transition of the model. I'm going to give this notation, the, the definition of the phase transition. Here, just a geometric inter interaction of the two-dimensional easy model for the nearest neighbor that you can see here. So I'll just throw here Z2. And for each vertex, there is an interaction né, in the neighbor. So it is highly non-independent, completely dependent, okay? completely dependent model. And for this type of models, we would like to study what we call the phase transition at low temperature. There are several types of results related to the easy model. The most classic ones is about the, for which values of the temperature there is uniqueness of the Gibbs measure or more than one Gibbs measure. That's what we call a phase transition. Historically speaking, easy is the first one who for uh, the one dimensional uh, lattice, there is no phase transition at any temperature. So this means that the Gibbs measure is unique in the thermodynamic limits. But later on, Pio showed that for other dimensions, the larger than equal to two, there is a phase transition at low temperature. And the method to prove this phase transition is the study of the different uh, Gibbs measure for two specific boundary conditions, all plus and all minus. At low temperature, it is possible to show that these Gibbs measure are different. Okay, mu plus and mu minus are different in the limits. And how to prove that? So the key to prove this, the, this statement is by using what we call right now the Pios arguments. Currently, we call these Pios arguments the one that there is a geometric notion that we call contours. And with that contours, we can show that phase transition. And more than that, this contour is so nice that we can study a lot of other properties with that. So the main idea of the contours is to study the symmetry breaking of the system. So let's recall contours for the one-dimensional easy model. 
So here I'm going to give this notion of contours. I'm considering here the red dot, the red spins, the boundary condition all plus, and inside of this box, I'm just putting any configuration plus and minus to make the contour for the nearest neighbors. Whenever you see uh, different spins in the nearest neighbors, we add a wall here. Okay? We, we separate them on the, on the duo of the lattice. So whenever you see plus, minus, plus, minus, we add some wall. So this means that we make this type of configuration. Okay? More than, so note that here, we have some closed uh, regions here. No? But there are some situations that we have some cross here. We don't want that cross. We want to force that all the contours should be kind of disjoint. So let's create a new rule. Whenever you see a cross, we are going to split into by using that, that rule. Know that by using the rule, we are merging some of the regions and also splitting some of the regions. Now you can see clearly that all the contours are disjoint. Here is a very simple one, but actually there are situations that it's possible to have one contour inside to the other. One contour that we have like that. Another the contour. For example, we have a lot of plus, minus, and so plus. It's completely okay to have one contour inside to the other. In terms of the surface, there are still these joints. Mm -hmm. This is the contour for the nearest neighbor easy model. Now I think about the contour. The key, yes, good question. Sure. When I have a contour inside other, it should be like in three levels. For... Yeah, yeah. So if you talk about the spins here, we have all plus. Whenever you see a wall, we see you see a spin flip, all minus. And since we have a wall again, you will see a okay. plus. That's right, exactly. That's what's going on. That's right. Let me. Uh, I think you back here. So the key steps to prove the phase transition by use the contours, I'm not going to give the complete details of the proof, but the most important steps to make sure that we can show this phase transition is what we call the pious bonds, which says the probability that a contour appears can be uh, controlled by exponential of minus two times beta times the size. What does this mean? It means that you consider very low temperature. Beta is the inverse temperature. Beta is very large. Since beta is very large, this guy is a very small number. So this means that it's very rare to see large contours. So if you see contours, you will see smaller contours. But since beta is very large, even the small contour is quite a rare. This is what's going on. We have a C of plus and so small, small island of minus. Now you can consider plus boundary condition. Another thing that it's make sure that we can control all of the contours one by one is that we can decompose the Hamiltonian into some of the contours. This works very well because we are talking about nearest neighbors uh, interactions. This is basically pious contours for the, the nearest neighbors easy model. Now I'm going to give, I'm going to introduce the notion of contours for the one-dimensional long range easy model. Before that, I'm going to explain a little bit the historical part of this result of this model. Now we are considering the same Hamiltonian, same model, same speed, minus one plus one, but instead of d-dimensional, is the equal to one, is the line, z. And I'm always considering our box, our lamp to be the interval, minus n to n, for example. Here, I'm considering that two body interaction. model and all gives measure are translation invariants. Hmm? So Eric, uh, yes. what happens for other values of alpha? Oh, very good question. For other values of alpha, for alpha larger than two, we can, it's possible to show that there is uniqueness, no phase transition. For alpha smaller than one, it breaks down one of the regularities of the Hamiltonian. It's not absolutely summable anymore. Mm -hmm. We cannot apply uh, Dobrushin uniqueness theorem, for example. 
So our phylogeny demo is to make sure that everything is regular, we can do some calculations. Let me focus to the phase transition. So first question but, here is, oh, yeah, was that question? Yes, sure. But uh, do you know, so, but there are limits, right? There are Gibbs measures. You don't know what happens, if they're unique or not. But In the alpha smaller than one? Yes. The problem is that alpha smaller than one is that if you consider, yes, yes there, we don't say, there's no such a, a large study about that. If, from what I know, maybe there are, but from what I know, I, I, know, I don't know very well about this part. But the problem that the, the the boundary condition is too strong. There is very sensitive né, on the inter interior. So if you have a plus, automatically have a lot of plus inside. If you have minus, you often have a lot of minus inside. That's basically what's going on when alpha is smaller than one. The interaction is too strong. So, so somehow it just you are just converting to a Dirac now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It basically convert to Dirac. Uh, the result that is uh, well, one of the questions that we want is: Is it possible to define contours in that case? Now, one thing here is if if you start to expect if you're familiar with the Hamiltonian, since you are considering long range interaction, for sure, or what we highly expect that this Hamiltonian is not additive anymore. Hamiltonian of the union contour might not be equal to the sum of the energy of each of the contours. That because two contours has some interaction, so really well controllable. So let's see what kind of result they, they have so far. So for this model, one dimensional easy model, long range, Katz and Thompson conjecture that there was a phase transition for alpha between one and two, excluding one, including two. Dyson is the first one who really proved phase transition partially in the sense that for all alpha between one and two, but not two. And the proof for Dyson is not by using Pio's argument. He, he didn't use contours, but he was Comparing to another model that we call hierarchical model, if I use some inequality that we call Rick's inequality, then we can get that phase transition. So he's not using contours. On the other hand, however, later on, Prolet and Spencer completed the conjecture showing that all people should choose does have phase transition at low temperature, but nothing that he they use contours. They define a notion of contours for this model. And here there are the two results, just completeness of the phase diagram at the critical temperature. There is a phase transition for alpha equals to two, but at the critical temperature for alpha between one and two, there's no phase transition. There's a second order phase transition. But let us focus on the Pio's arguments. Sorry, again. Yeah. Thank you. So let me focus again for the Pio's arguments. After Frode Spencer, it was quite a natural if it's possible to generalize the notion of contour for other alphas. Né? For the alpha between one and two, we have particle two. How about the others? Cassandro, Ferrari, Meron, and Presuti show that yes, it is possible to use that type of contour from Frode Spencer for other alphas. However, this type of approach needed to limit the range of alpha, it's not for any alpha between one and two, but for alpha plus and two, where alpha plus is that number here. So we can't really go through for any alpha between one and two. And then, Litty and Pico, later on, we kind of natural question is, oh, but what's happened to the other? Here is very technical, actually. Just make sure this alpha plus is quite a technical. So it's quite natural to ask, oh, but is it possible to really control for other alphas né, that's outside of this region? Litty and Pico showed two things. It is, first, it is possible to have some kind of additivity, not really additive, some, some bound that we call quasi additivity of the Hamiltonian. I'm going to give the formula later, okay? For any alpha between one and two, but more than that, they also show that by using the same notion of contour by Cassandro Ferrari, Merola Presuti, it's not possible to control the fire bounds outside of this region. That basically says, we cannot use that contours, it's impossible. If you want to use contours arguments for any alpha between one and two outside of, inside of this value, for example, we should create a new notion of contour and it's still open problem, we don't know. You, you know that Litin is here in Chile, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah in, in Chile. Antofa, in Antofagasta. Yes, yes, in yeah. Antofagasta, exactly. Yeah, yeah, we're happy yes. to receive you perhaps. Oh, that's right, yes. Yeah. That's right, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Litin, yes. <laughs> And later on, we, I have some, we have some results. Uh, John with Rodrigo Sacco, uh, Arnold Vanda, Bruno Kimura, Violeta Russell, is that uh, he, here I hide a little bit some condition. Actually, Cassandra, Ferrari, Nero, Presucci, in this type of model to extend for the alpha, actually it's, it's necessary, it's necessary 
uh, it's important to ask that the nearest neighbor interaction should be large enough, but it's completely technical. It's very artificial. It's not so far from being natural. So it is quite, actually it's much more natural to ask J1 equal to one. That's actually what Cronin Spencer did. Okay? So what we did is no, actually it is possible to remove that artificial condition, keep J1 equal to one, everything still works. That's what we did. All right, so since now I, I told you that it is possible to use contour argument, there's a definition of contours for the one dimensional long range model. I want to give you how the contour looks like. Okay, so this is the approach by Cassandro Ferrari, Perona and Presuti. Here we have the plus boundary condition and inside of the interval, any configuration plus and minus. Now let's construct what we call the triangle configuration. For each spin flick, we create a wall. I separate by some wall. Now I'm going to do the following. I'm going to perturb a little bit each of this wall, just a little bit, in order to each of these distance are different two by two. All of them has different values of distance, okay? Pick the smallest one, that one. This is the smallest one. Add a triangle. Remove the wall. Pick the second smallest one. Take this one. Add a triangle. Remove the wall. The, the wall. Pick the smallest one. Add a triangle. Remove the wall. Add a triangle. Remove the wall. We get what we call the triangle configuration. Someone can raise their hand and say that, oh no, this is the contours. Be careful, that's not the contours. If you use the each of the triangle to be like the contour, it doesn't work well. Okay. So what are the real contours? Here I consider a much larger um, in, uh, interval with some bunch of in triangles. And contour by definition are subset of the subset of triangles okay, satisfying some conditions. I want to give the condition. So basically what we have to do here is that Two set of triangles make different contour if they are far from each other. I'm going to give precisely what does far means here. Okay, so if they are too close, I consider just one one big contour. So if you want to make two set of triangles to be different contour, they should be very far. Okay? What does far mean? Far means that for a given two contours, gamma one, gamma two, they should satisfy that distance. They should be larger than some constants. Just a quantum that doesn't depend on anything, very large, the pixel very large. The minimum between the volume of each contour. Volume here means how many points we have inside of the triangle, inside of the contours, to the power cube. It's a little bit artificial, seems very artificial, but it's very important to have with this condition exactly because from very far to contours that are far to the other, the interactions are quite weak. Since they are weak, is almost independent. If they are not, they are not independent, but they are almost dependent. We can control very well their energy, and then we can conclude the Paris arguments. That's the reason they should be very far and far from this sense. Someone can ask, what does this three means? There is no natural interpretation for this three. Actually, it's very technical, okay? and just because calculation works very well. One question on the three. So, like uh, in the original uh, Frederick and Spencer, there is a three halves, but there is mm -hmm. an additional one. Exactly. So, uh, you're right, you're right, you're right. So, so and, and in that one, it goes between uh, one and two, essentially, these three halves. So why here is the three? Because you don't have like the mean condition or something? It's because of the, uh, there's one of the condition that we should, if you consider the this triangle, because the point of the product Spencer, this one, uh, they, they use the basically more or less the same condition, but because of this con controlling the, the triangles, uh, we have to consider three, not the minimum actually, we can consider two plus epsilon. If you don't see that. Maybe any number between two and three, but two doesn't work. Okay. Uh, it's because of the controlling of this energy of the interaction. Okay. Yeah, all right. Okay, so that's the contours. And once that we have these contours, follow the Pyro's argument. Of course, they have a little bit more technicality to control the Hamiltonian and so on. But basically, the proof by using Pyro's argument still works by using that contours. Uh, I also would like to give a little bit more information of this distance. So how to really make the, the contours né, by, by for a given triangles in this case? So for example, here we have P1, we have four triangles. Okay? I put five there four triangles. P1, P2, suppose that the distance is very small. So this basically should make one, one, one contour. We have two here. Two to the power of three is eight. Here we have two. The volume of the T3 is two. Two to the power of three is also eight. The minimum is eight. But I'm saying that the distance between T1, T2, and T3, T2 and T3 is smaller than 8C. So it's kind of close to each other. They should be one big contour. 
However, if you take a look D3 and T5, T5 is has polling post one. The minimum between eight and one is one. It's far from the, this bunch of triangle is far from T5. So we are making different contours. That's basically the idea. Uh, the paper from Cassandro Merora, Cassandro Ferrari, Merora Presuti, they show that the this algorithm is unique. It's always, uh, we can always create the same contour because we always want to see the finest one. That's how control controls in the one big long red easy model. And we are quickly speaking here, the, the quasi additivity of the Litin Pico. So it's not additive, remember the nearest neighbor, it was additive, it equals to that sum. For the longer range, it's not equal anymore. However, we can control by a lower bound. Constant times the one that we desire. Where this constant is a number smaller than one, positive smaller than one. That's the quasi additivity of the Hamiltonian. All right, so this is exactly what I want to talk about, the 1D long radius model. And now I'm going to go further. If, you, if we have for the 1D, is it possible to make contour for the other dimension? Someone can raise their hand and say, well, we use the same contour for the nearest neighbors. Because just neighbors, just contour, why you can, cannot use the same contours? Let's see, let's see. We are using, the, that's the definition of the Hamiltonian for the long radius model. Same formula, okay, Poly power decay. D dimensional now instead of uh, z z instead of d equals to one now it's any d i'm considering here lambda to be any box okay. and again i'm considering alpha larger than d just to satisfy some regularities that find is absolutely summable of the potential now some results about this uh, this model so first result by Ginibri, Grossman, and Quell, who show that there is a phase transition for alpha larger than d plus one Actually, it's quite expectable that should be true for any alpha larger than D. First result for alpha larger than D plus one. And interesting thing that they are using the nearest neighbor, the usual nearest neighbor contours to prove that. Later on, Griffiths, by using his inequality, uh, since we know that there is a phase transition for the nearest neighbor, adding more interaction, the ferromagnetic model, it makes sure that we have much more chance to have phase transition. It's much more stronger energy, so for sure. We can we conclude a phase transition for an alpha larger than D. Now we have a natural question. Is it possible to use that contour for alpha between D and D plus one? These two works are not really related to that uh, question, but from their works, it is possible to conclude that it's not possible. We can't use that near neighbor contours for alpha between D and D plus one. The main reason is because if alpha is larger than d plus one, the nearest neighbor energy is much stronger than the long range. While alpha between d and d plus one, the long range dominates. So it's really important to control the long range in that case. Nearest neighbor is weak enough. That's the reason we cannot use the nearest neighbor contours. Now we have the question, can we define the contours for that region? Yes, we can. So the result that we have, jointly with Lucas Afonso, Rodrigo Pisaco, and Satoshi Handa, uh, we define a very good notion for long ranges in model alpha between D and D plus one. Actually, it's worth for any alpha larger than D, okay? for, but for the main contribution is for that interval. Someone can raise their hand and say that, but what the point to define this contour? We already know that there's a phase transition. Right? If you follow the, the talk, you saw that most of the case the reason why we define the contour is to show phase transition. Ah, but we are, there, there was already some couple of questions of completeness of the phase transition for alpha like than D. What's the point to define this contour? So the important thing here is contour is not only to show phase transition. Once that we have contour, we can get much more information about your model. One of the consequences that we have so far with that contours is one of the application that we have with the non-homogeneous external fields. If the external field is constant, we can apply Li Yang, there's no phase transition. If you make this external field decay, we can use, we can uh, study the stability of the phase transition and uh, competition between that long range and the external fields. If I have time, I'm going to discuss that application. Okay. Another application is the random fields, random external fields. And there's a third one that you can develop cluster expansion by using that contours. All right, so once that I give you here the, that it is possible to define the contours, 
let me define the contours. So here I'm going to try to be as low as possible. Okay. So the, the idea of the contours is more or less based on the Pirogov Sinai contours by using plus and minus uh, correct, uh, correctness of this thing. I'm going to use this B1x just for L1 ball, okay, with radius one and center x like that. This is the balls. And for, for a given configuration of plus and minus, each point, I'm going to call you plus correct or minus correct, or otherwise incorrect. It is plus correct if the point itself and its neighbors in the ball are all plus. Minus correct is everything is minus, the neighbors and the, the guy itself. It's incorrect otherwise. So this is plus correct, minus correct, and incorrect. I'm calling the boundary of a configuration all the points that are not correct, all the points that are incorrect. This is what we call boundary. Let's see an example. Here we have a two dimensional. All of the construction of the contour here will be for d equal to two because we can see the picture, okay? But we can generalize for any dimension as well. Here I have the configuration of plus and minus and for each of them, we can see if some are plus, minus, correct, or incorrect. For example, here, this minus, it is in minus correct, right? Minus, minus, all the cross are minus. We can see that this plus here is plus correct, plus, all plus. This plus in the corner is also correct. Doesn't have to see that the other points have plus and plus in the neighbor, so it is plus correct. That point is incorrect, so that minus, and but the other neighbors are plus, so for sure incorrect. This, that plus here is incorrect. Although it has plus, 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 one of the neighbors is minus. It's incorrect. All right. So you see, each of points we can separate to plus, minus, correct, or incorrect. Let's remove all of the correct points. Now, all of them, I just, I just focus on the incorrect ones. This is the boundary. Okay. So whenever I talk about boundary of a configuration, remember this. The set of the incorrect points. Perfect. Because we're going to construct the contours from that boundary of the contours, boundary of the configuration. This is the definition. Don't be worried. Although, if you just read that without any picture, it will be quite impossible to understand the notion of contours. I'm going to give you a bunch of uh, pictures to understand how, how this works. But this is the definition of contours. It really requires a lot of conditions. Uh, I'm not going to read because I'm going to study each of the items in the next few slides. But the point here is that the contour comes from a partition of the boundary of the uh, configuration and satisfies some con uh, specific type of partition that we call NAR partition or MAR partition. Okay. And this partition should satisfy this inequality. We have it too for each contour. There is a specific type of decomposition, actually a weird decomposition. We're going to see how this decomposition works later. But there's a weird decomposition such that using that decomposition, you can see when the contours are separated, when we have disjoint contours. If you close, although we have a little bit technical here, technical part formula, if you look very closely, looks like the distance that we saw in the one dimensional case. Né? So actually, this mark partition that we define it actually is based on the contours made by Froelich and Spencer. They are using a method that we call mood scale arguments for the one dimensional. And we are basically using this, we are basing on this mood scale to construct that partition. Okay, it's based on the contours by Froelich and Spencer. So to really understand that mark partition, let's see some pictures. I'm going to explain all the items, okay? Here is a picture where the, con the condition A is false. Let me give a spoiler. This is a case when A is false. Let me see here. Remember, the set of contours is a partition. The set of contours is a partition of the boundary. And moreover, so let's complete reading the condition A. For a given two contours, that contour should be entirely inside of one connect component of the outside of the other uh, contour. Look here, we have two contours, gamma, gamma bar, and gamma prime. We have two contours. If you look gamma prime, know that they are in different connected components of the outside of this gamma, gamma bar. 
So remember, the complement of gamma bar is the white parts. But if you look each of them as these three parts, as just one contour, that makes this, moreover, false, because we have the different connected components. Perfect. So this is an example that A is false. Let's make A true. We have one contour gamma and three more. In total, four contours. Now it's correct. Another thing that you might realize, know that this gamma bar is disconnected, but makes one contour. That's perfect. That's completely OK. For the long range model, that's OK. Let's understand the condition B now. So there are two subconditions for the condition B. This type of decomposition, know that the number of the composition for this each of the contour should be bounded. You should have at most two to the power R minus one. And the distance should be bounded by this uh, min max. Okay. I just do remember, I forget to say where this N A R appears. And so it's appeared more because we have N here. M usually very big. A is that power, that the one dimensional was A equal to three. And R is that scaling. We're going to see that is R really important for the mode scaling argument. See, that's the result N A, N A R. So let me go back, sorry. Let me go back to B and let's continue here, from here. So assume that all of these connected components has diameter equal to N. I didn't write, but assume that all of them has diameter equal to n, okay? exactly n. So n, 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 n. And suppose that we have one contour here, where on n equal to one, k equal to one, there's only one guy. Here is another another contour where we have uh, three elements in union, so three the composition. I'm considering r equal to two. Two to the power two is four minus one, three. So everything's okay, at least so far, okay? at least for the composition. If you take a look at B2, they must be far from each other. How far? Since we assume that each of these pieces has diameter n, max of n is n, max of all n is n. So here, the mean of n, n is n. m is equal to 1 because we just choose m to be equal to 1. Replacing everything, the distance between contours should be larger than n to the power a. If you look here, I force that this 2 here is equal to n to the power a over 2. It's making the distance false. Since it's false, that's not the correct decomposition. So I'm giving here a, a picture that makes the statement false. Okay? So this is false because they are too close. We don't want to make close. We want to make this guy see each contour far enough to make to, to define, to make them to be two different contour. So that's false because they're too close. This is not the correct decomposition. That's not the correct decomposition. Actually, it should make a little bit different way to construct the, the correct ones. I'm going to give the algorithm how to correct, how to construct the correct contours. This one now, look that I put, assume that all of them, all of the diameter are again, all equals to, to n. Assume that this one is a little bit larger, n squared, for example. So uh, also n. So here we have distance to be two n to the power a. So now it's far from each other. It's still here larger than n to the power a. Okay. Sorry, I, I, I said alpha, but it's n a. Distance larger than n to the power a. It's two times. So it's already far. It's okay to have two different contours. But r is equal to I chose r to be equal to two. Each of the decomposition should have at most three. Here we have four. We don't want that. So that's a wrong way to make contours. So you see what's going on? I have really to make sure that each contour can be controlled by the number of uh, regions. Okay? And each of these, each two different regions that are different contours should be far from each other. OK, so this is exactly how the, at least the, the property works. OK, so this means that this is false. We have to make uh, different contours. Because for this one, actually, you can consider, you can merge this, two, this one. You can separate into. That one is our second contour, and the third contour is this three. And now everything works because the distance is larger than to the part A. So now we have three, actually, we should have three contours here. Okay. That's basically the idea of each of the, pro of, of the properties. Now, what we want to see is okay, once that we have the property, natural question is 
for a given shape, for a given this, for a given ratio of plus and minus for this uh, of the set of incorrect points. Can we make a contour satisfying the Mark partition? Remember, Mark partition M, M, A, and R are free to choose. We are choosing M, A, R. Right? So for a given M, A, R, can we always construct a contour for any boundary of the configuration? Yes, it is possible. That's what we proved. So actually, it is always for any value of M, A, I, M, A, and R, for any configuration where the boundary is finite, we can always construct a Mark partition, always. No exception. And the idea that we're going to explain, the algorithm construct that partition is by using Mood's KR arguments comes from the basis on Froelich and Spencer. One thing before talking about the construction that I'm going to teach right now is so far, it was very cute here. I just give a very cute uh, examples, uh, counter examples, but in all of them, as you can see, that was looks like a partition. Be careful, that's not partition. Actually, it can be very crazy in some sense. This decomposition B1, each of this gamma bar K, it can overlap. Doesn't have to be disjoint. Worse, actually, this gamma bar can be each of the gamma bar K can be even disjoint. It doesn't have to be connected. Doesn't have to be connected. We are going to see. We are going to see the construction. Why you will see the construction? We will also see where this gamma bar K appears. Okay? So let's start constructing the contour. I'm setting n equal to one, r equal to k, and a is just a. Okay? Well, we don't we don't really care about the specific value of a in this case. We have this region. This gray region are the region where that's the boundary of the configuration. All the incorrect points, all the white ones, either correct, minus or plus correct. Yes. Have you some sort of combinatorial description of the boundary? What can be a boundary? It can be anything in the at least it, 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 it can be thick, it can be thin, it can be it can be yeah, I suppose, but can you when you when you make a picture for designing some boundary, do you know what kind of restriction there is no constraint? Nothing? No, there is even no 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 constraint at all. It can be because we are considering any configuration. For any given configuration, the boundary can be okay. Of course, I mean, that boundary is constricted in the sense that it's come from a configuration. That's the restriction, let's say. OK? Yeah. So yeah, you're right. There is, there is no kind of restriction for the boundary. For any boundary, we can construct that smart partition. And there is no restriction for to define it. It has to be a little bit fat, no? Because if you have like a, a C of plus and one minus, at least the boundary has uh, nine points. Ah, that's right. That's right. It's a little bit Ah, sorry. This, this, this doesn't make sense. Eh? You're right. That's, that's true. That's true. Yes. Okay, so we start with incorrect points. Other questions? We start with incorrect points. And this is how the multi-scale argument works. So let me try to be, uh, try to be a little slow here. So first thing here is uh, I'm considering r equal to three. Remember, two r minus one equal to seven. From now on, it's better, better idea to start keep tracking. r equal to three. Two r minus one is two to the power three minus one equal to seven. I hope. So once that we have this value, first thing here is we are going to remove all these contours. That's very small. What the small means has less than two r minus one points. Suppose that this one is very small, so small that I'm going to just remove. Okay. The others are larger than more than two r minus one points. Right now, the multi-scale arguments happens. First step, I for the degree on the Z2 or any ZD, I'm going to uh, not really do a tiling, but I'm going to do a covering with some specific cubes, the entire grids, the entire Z2. Which grid, which cube are considering? The sides is two to the power R, and the centers are all pointing ZD in Z2 here. That we have some bunch of uh, squares. Someone can raise their hand and say that, well, this is a rectangle, it's not a square. Why is it we can see a rectangle here? It's because if you consider a point, okay, point is the center, and let's consider a four, side equal to four, just to understand better what's going on. So we have 
uh, sorry, the, the size is two. Okay? Here, the size is two. We've centered the sector. So the center is another point in ZD. So we have another point. We have another point. And if you make another square, the square will lapse. So we are not talking about tiny here. The square doesn't have to be disjoint. It can be it can overlap. And that's what's going on here. So it actually is a bunch of overlapping squares. Okay. With that, let's know that I just spoke, I actually I put, I'm doing for all the entire grids, but I just focus in the one that's covering the region. Now let's take the minimal covering. Pick the minimal covering of these cubes. That's what's going on. Now we're going to do the following. Here, I didn't write here, so I'm going to, uh, to draw on the on the slide, uh, on the whiteboard. I'm going to define a graph from this picture, where the vertices of the graphs are the cubes. And the two, so two cubes form the edge if the distance between them is by that value here. Where this value first, before defining the, the graph, where this value comes from, that value. Instead of uh, writing the, the following way, let me just put all the power A. Let me factorize this power A. We have that now. Remember that we are talking about cube with size 2R. What does this D times 2R mean? The diameter of the cube. Of course, you can see the cube. So actually, the distance is related to the m times the diameter of the cube to the power a, because it works. Okay? Because it works. Let's define now the, the that's graph. So we have here all of the vertices that are the cubes, and we have to make a graph where the edges are made when two vertices have distance at most that value. And assume here that this one is joint. So it can happen something like this. I have some, some cubes, like that, another cube. If I can correct correctly, it's like this, something like this now. And we think each of the uh, square to be a vertex. Know that these two are blue, are first, they have intersections, so this means that the distance is zero. So from the edge, from the edge, from the edge, 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 edge. If that distance here, if that distance is smaller than C times that condition, if it's smaller, then we connect. Okay. If it's far, we don't connect. That's how to how we are going to make the graph. Make sense? Does it make sense? Right. Assume here that this is far okay? from that condition. Assume that's far. Now we have a bunch of Connected component graphs. Count in each connected component, count how many vertex, how many vertices that connected component has. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Know that this one has more than seven. I'm going to see all the connected component that has less than or equal to two R minus one. This one, so remember that seven, if you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, this is more than seven, we don't do anything here. One, two, three, three is smaller than seven. We are going to remove. Look at this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Remember that there's overlap here. Okay? We have exactly seven vertices. Okay. And suppose that this one is very far from the this one is very far from the rest. So this one has a connect component, only seven. We are going to remove them. I have these two. The others, I remain, it's remained. It. This two is gone. Let's do the multi scale again. Which multi scale? Instead of 2 to the power r, now the next cube is a little bit larger 2 to the power 2r. In other words, we are going to see other steps, but in each step, the multi scale is when the cube, the size of the cube, I'm going to use s of the cube, the size of the cube is 2 to the power r times the time of the multi scaling. Okay? Second step, t equals to two, we have a larger uh, squares. The center is on the multiple of two r. Okay? And now we do the same. Just write the, the, 
entire square in the grid, look the one that covers, take the minimal cover, took the minimal cover. Write the graph again, the same graph. Now know that the graph, the distance is according to the scale. We have two to the power eight, two are here, t equals to two. Now the distance increasing because of the multi-scale, because of the scaling that they're considering. So this means that the one that's a little bit far can be merged right now. Assume, for example, that this one now is very close, close in this sense, smaller than this distance. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven satisfies that cover, which is smaller than or equal to seven. This one we have definitely, you can see there are more than seven vertices. So this one remains, this one is cut. Now t equals to three, t equals to three. Larger, uh, larger squares, considering the, the covering, take the minimal one, I think this is the minimal one, and counts one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, there are more than seven. So in this case, remains, you do nothing. Keep it doing, t equals to four. T equals to four, we have discovery and counts. One, two, three, four, five. If you take very closely, we have five cubes here, okay? We have five cubes, five smaller than seven. Erase, and we completely clean the board. What we have is exactly contours. This is one contour, this is another contour, that's another contour, another contour, another contour. We have one, two, three, four, five, five contours satisfying all the conditions of the Mar partition. We did the Mar partition here following the algorithm. That's the algorithm. Okay. Yes. So I had a question which was a little bit before. Yes. So why can't you take the partition just everyone? So it satisfies uh, all your properties, no? Like if you... That's a good question. Good question. So uh, if you do the, the one that satisfies everywhere, the, the one that perfect pick, pick everyone, this one is the useless one, right? So what do we want? We want the one that's not really useless. That's a good question. Actually, we have to add one more thing that I, I hide here. Pick the finest one. Okay, very good question, actually. Pick the finest one. And the finest one is actually unique. We can show that this because so, and, and, and the second one is, can you start with uh, this one and then cut it? Like, can you start from the, the, the useless one and say, okay, but if I can find one set, I will take it out. And then, uh, okay, now I have two, and then I find another one, and I also get to the minimum one like that. We need to understand, that, that's the okay. thing. Okay, it's more or less, see, I just have to be careful in how to do, maybe it works, if I, if I'm, not, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, maybe it works, maybe it works. Okay. Yeah. This one for sure works. Okay. Are, probably, I'll have to discuss a little bit more to make sure that it works. Okay, thank you. So that's my partition, we get the control, yes. Is there a unique finest one? No. Or you don't... It is unique, it is unique. It is unique. This is unique, yes. The, part, the mark partition is, will be unique, okay? Right, that's it, this is the mark partition. And from these contours, we can do a lot of things that's very similar to the Pyro's arguments. We have the entropy, so if you count the number of contours that contain the origin, that size equal to m, the number of contours increase exponentially, exactly what we wanted to show Pyro's arguments, for example. This is the Pyro's bounds, the, 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 the entropy, the entropy condition. And another thing is the additivity. Remember that in the nearest neighbor, the Hamiltonian is additive and the long range one dimension is quasi additive. Of course, here long range, so it should be kind of quasi additive too. Exactly, that's true. That we have quasi additiveness. So the difference between the, con the configuration and removing one contours can be bounded by the size of that contour. Okay. So, that, so it, we can control. We control the energy of a contour. We can control, we can control the energy of the contour. Be careful here, in the, in the usual pyro dark veneers neighbors, it only depends on the size of the contour. Here, size means the number of incorrect points on that contour. Here, since it's longer range by using plus and minus correct, we should also add the interior of the contour and the support of the contour, the energy of the interior and the support, where the energy is this one. Okay. But by using these two proposition, for example, you can use all of the nice results related to the Pius arguments using well, contours. Which is the dependent of C1 with respect to lambda? It does not depend on lambda, no? In the, in the first proposition. Ah, in the first proposition. Ah, C, C1, so C1 doesn't depend on lambda, that's right. So C1 is just a constant. It's just a constant. No, yeah, exactly. For exactly. all lambda. All lambda. Okay. There is no dependence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. C1 is just a constant, universal constant. Right. 
I have a little bit more time. Really? Five minutes, Roger. Five minutes. I'll go. Okay, that's actually the application. Let me try to be a little bit, sorry to be very quick, but one of the applications that I mentioned about the decaying fields. Now. So I'm considering the Hamiltonian adding a one body field, and that's not constant. It decays polynomially as well. And the question is what's the relation between the power alpha for the uh, for J's and power delta for H so that we still have phase transition? Actually, this is a kind of work, these are type of the problematic part of this model is that this Hamiltonian, uh, the model is not translation invariant anymore. So we cannot use pressure, for example. There are several tools that's for the translation invariant that doesn't hold anymore for this model. So have to be careful uh, to show this type of phase transition. So the technique to show this by using Pyro's argument, showing that mu plus and mu minus are different. And actually, something that's quite uh, funny here that even that we have a presence of external of fields, if the case two fact, there is a phase transition. And actually, this is what we reproved re here. So I'll I I skip here. Let me just show you that the heuristic argument, if you're familiar, that the imlima argument is basically what I'm doing here, that you expect. Uh, what's the relation between alpha and delta to have phase transition? This is the energy of the contour, let's say. Okay? The energy of the, when the contour is just a ball of radius r. Okay? And this is the energy of the contour for that contour, that ball. It is possible to do some calculation of this, or some approximation. Uh, approximately speaking, that energy increases r to some specific powers. And that power depends on the value of alpha. If you look here, an alpha like the d plus one, that's exactly the incre increment, the, how this energy increase as like as the nearest neighbor is the model increases. And the other things are non trivial because we are outside of the near, when the nearest neighbor are strong enough. Why, or if you replace a to be one over x to the power delta and do some calculation, you see that the order is r to the power d minus delta. What does this mean? So just one, one, specific, one huge computation. To show phase transition, we expect that the energy of the two-body interaction of the contour should be stronger than the external fields. So for example, consider this one, 2D minus alpha. 2D minus alpha. If this one is larger than D minus delta, we expect phase transition because the energy contour energy is much stronger than the one-body external fields. If you do some calculation, you see that delta is larger than alpha minus d. And this is exactly what we prove it. So before the statement, I'm showing here the picture of our statement. We can prove that when the delta is larger than alpha minus d here, we have this transition. Of the gray region, there is a phase transition. On the curve, on that curve, we can show phase transition when the constant in front of H is small enough. Just remember, sorry that my five point is a little bit messy, but H I is H star divided by uh, this So we have a constant in front of the parameter H I. If this H, H star is very small, we can show phase transition. This region here, we don't know. We expect that there's it's unique. There's no phase transition, but we don't know how to. There's no. It's still open. We don't know how to prove. And that's just the theorem of what we show in the picture. So this means that for any delta larger than this value, there is a phase transition at low temperature. So in, in other words, if you restrict, restrict alpha to be between d and d plus one, we have that condition, exactly the condition from the heuristic arguments. And the proof of this theorem is by using bias arguments, contours arguments. And that is what we're going to talk about. And thank you very much. For any questions? So yes. thank you very much for your talk. I have too many questions for you, but yes. So, uh, so how do you use pairs? Because usually we just uh, make a contour disappear with pairs. Is it, this is exactly what you're doing? That's right. So if you make the contour disappear, we have that comfortable energy. Yes, exactly. Okay. So that's the idea. You this. this is the, what you said. Uh, Removing the contour. And and the other things like uh, usually pairs that that's not always. If I'm not wrong, go to exactly the critical point. No? No, and uh, no. so, so is it 
so, so maybe it's what you say, but yeah, right. if, for example, if this only works for H small enough, maybe it works, maybe it can work for H big or, or it's just... No, we, we expect to be for the entire temperature larger than the, the, the critical, uh, larger, larger than critical of low temperature. So of course, this one by using pyros, as you said, we, we, all, we can only show for sufficiently low temperature, sufficiently small temperature. What do you expect to be for any? So in dimension one, you suspect that there are some kind of, of uh, contours or like there is no possible? Ah, that's a good question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, from my, from, this is my point of view, but we are talking about easy model, no? that we have this flipping that everything is very cute in some sense. So I, I, it's a really blind guess, but I believe that there should be some kind of contours for any alpha between one and two. But it's just my feeling. I, I can't say I can't give any other arguments why it's my feeling. Thank you. I will keep asking you more questions afterwards. <laughs> Great. Uh, so I have a question that regarding what you told the video. So is it can you just like uh, remove contours here because uh, or is it like bit of Sinai where you have to be careful when you remove a contour? I uh, would have to be, be I mean, uh, making to remove contours basically making you, you put all the correctness should be all correct plus or minus correctness. It depends on the label of course. When you remove contour, you have to be careful with the label of the correctness to be everything consistent. But basically, it is removing contours. The one that we de described here, the mark partition, know that I'm not considering any label here now because right, it's just a, what we call the free contours, the one that's on the geometrical parts. But if you really want to work on this type of prior arguments, we have to be careful with the labels because of the spirit of life. And then the, the labels uh, play the role, and then you have to be careful in how to remove the, the guy, the contour, because of the labels. So, yes. And for well, I have another question. Mm -hmm. So can you go back to the slide where you showed uh, all the things that you're working on now with the contours? Ah, right, yes, yes. So I, I just want to meditate on that. <laughs> I think this one. Uh, okay. okay. But okay, you, you expect to be able to show all this exponential uh, exponential mixing and all these. I use contour. Like, yes, yeah. yes. Once that we have contour, we expect to all the most of the work that is contour dependent. We believe that might be possible to to get that conclusion, same conclusion. Okay. Uh, 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 and how how is in, in bigger dimension with this idea that you can separate things yes. between uh, your hypercolation of graphs or something like that? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Is that you have some, you can go from one place to another one by only bus, by plus one. By the ah, plus right, one. yes. Or minus one. Mm -hmm. or minus one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it depends on your boundary condition. Yes. And what happens in, in bigger direction, in, in bigger dimensions? Can you have some sort of. I, I, I think it is the same, no? It, I think it's the same. Okay. So we have two contours that are disjoint. Uh, it's 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 it should be of course we have to be careful because it should be. Uh, uh, what would be the good the, the good way to do it because you have more than one you have many dimensions. So. Ah, the depths. Um. Ah, I see. I see. Talk about the the distance, no? Yeah. Ah, but I, I, the distance here is the. If I understand your question, uh, the distance that they're considering here is the distance in L1, L1, distance. L1, 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 L1 distance. L1 distance, exactly, the distance. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. That's Sorry. That's okay. Okay. But, uh, Many, uh, <laughs> Many mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, then if not, we thank Eric again. Thank you very much. Yeah. In, 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 in
next time you can you come you can contact yeah yeah okay. he's very nice and mm -hmm. he comes to the CMM from time to time yeah he, he was my student ah right he, he comes from time to time 